Just give me a little bit of peace. Yeah. Steady job is some food to eat. Just give me a little bit of peace. Yeah. Steady job is some food to eat. Oakland's Just first large scale drug kingpin. I'm talking about Felix the Cat Mitchell. Talk to me about yes. him. The godfather of San Antonio Village Projects. Felix the Cat, at a young age, knew that he was not going to be living in the poverty-stricken environment that he was coming up in. Um, I think he was unlike many of his age where he could sit and plot as a youngster and really notice what's going on around him. Of course, he came up in the 50s and 60s and early 70s in a very pivotal time for the black community with the civil rights movement and the rise of, you know, the drug trade, um, the end of the Vietnam war and a lot of stuff going on in the country at that time. Really, you see the, the shift of the drug trade, which is another fascinating thing to look at. And this is where I was kind of talking about before it kind of shifts from the Italian mob and the Italian community controlling it over it, it trickles into the um, black communities. And this is something that Felix the Cat would take care of and take advantage of himself. He was the founding boss of Oakland's notorious 6-9 mob, sometimes just called the mob, and I believe that was in the 69th Street area of Oakland. And this would be, become a very powerful drug organization. And he founded this at in you know as a teen and he turned it into a narcotics empire controlling a vast heroin trade at first cohorting with drug bosses from LA including Tootie Re- Re- excuse me Tootie Reese and reaching as far as Detroit and other major cities in New York um, and at first he didn't really deal with much rivalry or much violence but this kind of changes in the 80s with the rise of cocaine and the drug trade and as well as him fueling um, the drug trade in his city which created other rival groups and you know enemies and more violence came as time went on and these top um, competitors would be the likes of Mickey Moore aka Mickey Mo and Funktown USA led by Harvey Wisenton And apparently Harvey was part of his crew, uh, part of Felix's crew before he broke off and started his own thing. And after a while, violence, it was, you know, inevitable. They kind of just dealt with it. And um, Oakland kind of turned into, you know, locals called it a war zone. Excuse me. And like I mentioned before, as cocaine started to come into the game, that was a little bit more cutthroat drug um, to control and you know you you see guys walking the streets with like automatics and stuff like that in Oakland and just big time weaponry that really just they kind of say happened in a, in a sense overnight over there um, but nonetheless his 6ix9ine mob enterprise Felix the Cats really flourished he was making millions living a flashy lifestyle and giving back to his community. Um, And, you know, this lasted for him from like the late seventies all the way up till 85 when he would be arrested. And I think this is really when, um, you know, he kind of had more notoriety at this point with the rise of the war on drugs and all of that scene, which is something that, you know, people I think should definitely look into if they're interested in this kind of stuff, that's probably, I would say my favorite thing to uh, study in all this stuff was the drug trade around this time and how it, you know, uh, affects different communities and so on and so forth. Um, So he was arrested in 85 and he was tried, convicted and sentenced to life. And he would be, he would find himself in Leavenworth prison in Pennsylvania and uh, I believe that's in Pennsylvania. <clears throat> and there he would be stabbed to death during a dispute of some sort. He was standing up for somebody and, uh, you know, tables turned on him and he got stabbed. 
killed. And what really put him on the map was actually his uh, lavish funeral, which was seen on a national level on news broadcasts with images and film showing his some 8,000 mourners, you know, standing by the procession, including multiple Rolls, Rolls Royces and limos and his, you know, famous 6K um, casket being carried by a horse-drawn carriage. And this was really what put <clears throat> Felix Cat Mitchell on a map nationally. I don't think many people outside of the black communities and inner cities really knew what was going on until, you know, this time period in history with Felix the Cat Mitchell really being the forefront and the face of this time um, and, you know, what the impact of drugs had on inner cities. You know, people were really, you know, starting to take note of this course like i said before with the with the uh rise of the war on drugs and all of that you know felix the cat mitchell's story in his life and his funeral is where people began began to see the impact of drugs on inner cities mm. and um when felix the cat died oakland somehow got even more violent because there wasn't a guy who was able to control the drug trade like he did now you know this is something that's apparent in many cities at the t of the time. Um, you know, you had your major players in pretty much every city. Um, and it's comparable to uh, as someone I always go back to. Same kind of thing happened in Harlem a little bit earlier when Ellsworth Bumpy Johnson died in the late 60s. You started to see a lot new, a lot of new independent operators jumping into the drug game. Um, and a lot more violence coming along too. So Felix the Cat Mitchell is the godfather of Oakland in that sense of where he really demanded respect and he controlled it. And without him, you know, it, all hell broke loose because there was nobody like him who can control the drug trade um, in his city. So Felix the Cat is another fa fascinating character. And of course, his enterprise would more or less be um, inherited by Lil D., Daryl Reed in Oakland <clears throat> with the rise of the crack era, which was a whole new uh, time in itself. And, um, you know, I, I kind of cut to the chase with on the Felix, Felix the Cat Mitchell story, but um, he is a legend. And like I said, he is just one of many of his kind. This kind of thing was happening in many different cities. Um, you know, you had big time players in Philadelphia, New York City, Chicago. Detroit is another major, major city when it comes to the um, early days of the, you know, black organized crime and black drug trade, um, stuff like that. So it's just a really fascinating time in organized crime history. Probably one of my favorites, just studying the shift of the drug trade and like I said, Felix the Cat Mitchell was right at the top of that. And during this time period, you know, before like the little D's of the world took over and crack was the big drug, were they making the majority of their money off of heroin? Is that safe to say? I would say that it started off with heroin, yes. And this was like the late 60s through the 70s. And then with the rise of the cocaine cartels in Colombia and South America and Mexico, you know, doing their thing, helping out with that. Th then you started to see cocaine come into play. And this was, you know, around the early eighties to through the eighties really. And about midway through then was when they started smoking cocaine. So it kind of went heroin, then cocaine came into play and it was kind of both of them and then you know you don't really exactly free basin and then they just started smoking crack and that was like the new thing and you could also this is what they call the game so you could actually include pimping and gambling in that sequence pimping and gambling were the two major things and then you had your drug dealers too <laughs> the guys started to find out that drug dealing was the real money maker and um, I'll give you an example there was a uh, big time big time legendary kingpin in Detroit by the name of Eddie Fat Man Jackson 
and him and a guy by the name of John Classen, they were the pioneering dope dealers in heroin, dope wholesalers in, um, in Detroit um, dealing heroin. And when they, when guys in the game in Detroit, you know, in the black community, pimps and, and um, gamblers saw the money that these guys were making overnight, they dropped what they were doing and became dope dealers all the top gamblers and pimps and this was happening in every city um i'm most well versed on this scene in harlem um i know most of the major players during this time and the same kind of thing happened like i said before you had bumpy johnson controlling everything in the black community um and then he died and guys would come about i know a lot of people like to talk about the frank lucases and the nicky barnes but there were guys before them there was a guy by the name of jimmy goldfinger terrell who was first heroin godfather of harlem in my opinion um you know post bumpy johnson there was another guy by the name of big robbie stepney um there was a guy by the name of walter grant who started off as a lieutenant of uh, Jimmy Goldfinger Terrell, but Jimmy Goldfinger Terrell was a major player. Um, I believe that he might have even plugged Felix the Cat at one point. I'm not positive on that, but he he definitely plugged Fat Man Jackson. He definitely put Fat Man Jackson of Detroit into um, touch with the Gambino crime family in New York City to get their money. Uh, excuse me, drugs. Um, I'm rambling on about this. I'm, you know, oh, getting best. off. But yeah, it's 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 my favorite time period. I think so. Definitely a great thing to look at. Well, you know, some might argue different differently, but um, the time that I'm really fascinated about. I think some if you're into this kind of stuff, it's something that some people should also look into.